series involving Hollywood's senior side, the story of silent film star Ramon Navarro is one you will not want to miss. The savage and barbaric murder of this legendary movie star has people whispering and cringing to this day. In the 1920s, Ramon Navarro was the heir apparent to the late great matinee idol Rudolph Valentino. Navarro starred in more than 40 films, including the original Ben-Hur. He was adored by women the world over for his handsome face and sleek physique. But on Halloween morning, October 31st, 1968, the 69-year-old Latin lover was found in his Hollywood Hills estate, brutally beaten to death. After decades of obscurity, the reclusive silent screen star was suddenly on the front page of every newspaper in the world. Rumors about exactly what happened are still circulating. Lots of booze, a couple of male hustlers, and torture all play a part in one of Hollywood's sleaziest murders. On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll see what made Ramon Navarro a legendary leading man. I mean, at least my thoughts will always be with you. and examine how his secret double life eventually destroyed him. He would uh, purchase sex on a fairly regular basis, but not everybody was his cup of tea. And we'll hear accounts of Navarro's cruel and vicious slaying. These fellows figured that he was $5,000 in that room, and that was for the cause of the torture. He was so brutally and severely beaten that uh, he was practically, his body was practically mutilated. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me as we examine the heartless Halloween murder of a once dashing movie legend, Ramon Navarro, and explore the night his secret obsession came back to haunt him. This one's a real freak show, folks, because these tricks were no treat. It was the late afternoon of October 30th, 1968, the day before Halloween known as All Saints Eve. 69-year-old silent film legend Ramon Navarro was enjoying a quiet day gardening at his Hollywood Hills home when the phone rang. Ramon couldn't have known that this call would foreshadow a night of unimaginable terror. Navarro biographer Alan Ellenberger continues the haunting tale. It was from a hustler, called himself Paul. He said that he wanted to come up and visit with Navarro. And as Navarro usually did, he told him, well, why don't you come on up? We'll have a few drinks, and we'll see what happens. And he said, well, I have a brother. He's 17 years old. Can I bring him with me? And Navarro said, sure, no problem. Actually, big problem. This wasn't the first time Navarro had casually invited a male prostitute to his home. His days as a silent screen heartthrob were far behind him. They arrived at Navarro's house about 5.30 p.m. By the time the clock struck midnight, Ramon's house guests had gone. What they left behind was the savagely beaten corpse of a once great movie star lying naked on his blood-soaked bed. A grim ending to a life that began under much happier circumstances. Ramon Navarro was born on February 6, 1899 in Durango, Mexico. He was born to a very well-to-do family. His father was a dentist. His mother was from an aristocratic family. They lived in a large estate that they called the Garden of Eden. Ramon was the eldest of 13 children of a devoutly Catholic family. As a boy, Navarro was torn between the priesthood and a career his family found less acceptable. He had always been interested in singing. He decided that the best place to start a singing career was in the United States. He was uh, 15 years old at the time. He tried to convince his parents, you know, to let him go. And because of all the problems that were going on in Mexico at the time, they agreed. What was going on was the Mexican Revolution. Ramon's parents decided that sending their son to scout a new life in America might be a smart idea. In 1915, Navarro headed to Los Angeles. The 15-year-old took odd jobs to support himself, including doing extra work in some silent films starring Rudolph Valentino. In those days, Valentino was the biggest movie star in the world. Veteran Hollywood columnist James Bacon. There was a time when the Latin lovers dominated the silent screen. I mean, that's how, how big Latin lovers were silent movies. Of course, that was because of Valentino. In 1921, Navarro's exceptional good looks caught the attention of director Rex Ingram, who cast him in a bit part playing the devil. Despite the ridiculous outfit and the bizarre makeup, 21-year-old Navarro was a natural. Ramon soon landed his first starring role in a film called The Prisoner of Zenda. Actor Jeff Corey worked with Navarro. 
He had class, he had style. You know, there was a kind of grandeur about him. He was not a big man, he was a short man. But um, he, had, he had style and he had presence. He signed contract with Rex Ingram and Metro Studios. The next three or four pictures, Rex Ingram just put him in and he was just made him the star of the pictures from then on. And with each picture, Navarro just became more uh, popular. And then came the role of a lifetime. Every, every male star in Hollywood probably tried out for the part of Ben-Hur. It was much like the search for Scarlett O'Hare years later for Gone with the Wind. Everybody wanted to play it. The merger with MGM came about, and Louis B. Mayer became head of MGM. And so they, they hired Ramon Navarro to star as Ben-Hur. He and Louis got along very well, because Raymond Navarro made MGM, and that was the, the first major p picture that MGM made. And Ramon was very, very big at it. Navarro was 27 years old when he made the silent film classic Ben-Hur. Ramon had become a full-fledged movie star, but fame created a potential problem. You see, up to this point, Navarro's sexual preference had been kept under wraps until one night when Ramon and a friend stepped out for a little entertainment. During the making of Ben-Hur, Ramon went to, with uh, William Haynes, who was also homosexual, to a uh, male bordello. Somehow, Louis B. Mayer found out about it, and he had the LAPD close down the bordello. If the public found out that the star of Ben-Hur, which was a religious epic, was a homosexual, it could have stopped the picture, closed MGM forever. And I think this is why Ramon first became closeted from then on, because of the realization that if people found out, his career would be over. And Ramon's career was bringing in 10 grand a week, which in the 1920s was an insane amount of money. Certainly more than enough to build one heck of a nice closet. But money can't buy love. Coming up, a once great star descends into oblivion. And a careless phone call cracks the murder case of Ramon Navarro. In 1926, Ramon Navarro was, next to Rudolph Valentino, the most beloved heartthrob of the silver screen. The 27-year-old Mexican-born actor had just finished the epic silent film Ben-Hur, which was both a critical and commercial success. Ramon Navarro was now rich, famous, handsome, and a confirmed bachelor. Publicity on him was just phenomenal. There was uh, covers of magazines were with him, with him on it, which was rare in the 20s. Usually covers of the fan magazines like Photoplay were mostly women. Ramon had about three or four different covers during the late 20s. He seemed like a, a hell of a guy, you know. He, he, he was brave, he was his own man, he was funny, he got along with people, everybody loved him. He was idolized by women, of course, being very handsome and a romantic Latin lover and appeared in a lot of romantic movies. Navarro never gave up his love of music and demonstrated his singing talent whenever possible, as seen in this 1928 interview. I'm going to sing you an old Mexican folk song. The title of it is, uh, I Like All of Them. Me gustan todas, me gustan todas, me gustan todas en general. What Navarro's fans didn't know was that this Latin lover had a secret sex life that, if discovered, would destroy his career and the reputation of Hollywood's biggest movie studio, MGM. And the head of MGM was not about to let that happen. Louis B. Mayer wanted Ramon to get married to, um, for his fans, you know, because in the press there, was, there were stories all the time questioning why Ramon never got married. And of course his reason was always that he had his own family to take care of. And he always said that he would, he would never marry. Many of the more astute members of the press knew the truth, but in those days Hollywood journalists knew how to keep a secret. Stars who were gay early days of Hollywood were protected, you know, to, to have a premiere and they, uh, they'd always put a gay star with a, a real sex pot, like I used to with uh, Rock Hudson. We knew if we come out and said so-and-so was a homosexual, that'd be the end of his career. But the whole gay thing still made Louis B. Mayer very nervous, especially when it came to Navarro, his most popular leading man. It is rumored that Louis B. Mayer had to get him out of several scrapes with the law pertaining to his homosexuality with his uh, going out and, you know, cruising for men. 
Although Ramon may have had a wandering eye, some suggest he was involved in an ongoing affair with none other than Rudolph Valentino. Well, Ramon talked a lot about Rudolph Valentino, which made me kind of suspect. I thought maybe he and Valentino had been lovers. There was always a suspicion that Valentino was gay because his two wives were both lesbians. But that's another episode entirely. It certainly would have been demoralizing for the millions of women who adored Valentino and Navarro to find out that these two Latin lovers were adoring each other. Then in 1926, Valentino died suddenly at the age of 31. Ramon Navarro, next in line to the throne, became the king, but his reign was to be short-lived. The climate in Hollywood was changing. He faded out when uh... The screen turned to Clark Gable. His films just gradually got worse and worse and started losing money. Your He-Man stars were coming up, and they were driving the, the Latin lovers out, out, especially ones who were suspected of being gay. So that was the end of the, the Latin lovers. They just decided that that was enough and um, ended his contract in um, January of 1935. He was 35 at the time. It was around this time also that he started his drinking and never stopped. So Ramon Navarro was washed up at 35. Luckily, he invested wisely, and Ramon was a very wealthy man. He was also a very lonely man who turned to booze, and lots of it for comfort. But Navarro also found another way to deal with his loneliness, and this little quirk would eventually lead to his tragic and untimely end. Straight ahead, the next bizarre chapter in the life of a legendary film star and his slow descent into the sleepy side of Hollywood. By 1935, the career of legendary silent screen hero Ramon Navarro as the leading man was essentially over. During the next few decades, Navarro took occasional character roles, but for the most part, Ramon lived a simple life of leisure, thanks to his sizable real estate investments. But in 1968, this distinguished actor, now 69 years old, met an appalling and undignified fame. I'm A.J. Benza. Welcome back to Mysteries and Scandals. Given some of the company Navarro had been keeping over the years, not to mention the amount of booze he'd been putting away, Ramon himself had unknowingly set the wheels in motion for his own terrible and tragic ending. Ironically, throughout his life, Ramon Navarro remained a devout Catholic despite conflicts with his homosexuality. He went to church every week, sometimes a couple times a week. Um, he would go on religious retreats. There were several times he wanted to be a priest. He went to a monastery. He wanted to become a Jesuit. This is after he'd been, been a big movie star. For some reason, which was never explained, the, the Jesuits turned him down. He knew that the church said that homosexuality was a sin. I believe that was one of the major reasons why, why he also drank, to numb the guilt. What Ramon may have felt most guilty about was his appetite for young male prostitutes. Attorney Richard Walton. Ramon Navarro was a discreet, discriminating homosexual. Uh, he would uh, purchase sex on a fairly regular basis, but not with not everybody was uh, his cup of tea. There was many times when he might uh, simply give somebody a tip and send him on his way. Sex wouldn't always be involved. There would be a lot of times he would cook them dinner. He would sit down and they would talk. They would watch TV. They might play cards. A lot of drinking was involved usually, too. There was a lot of rumors about Navarro going around because a lot of the male prostitutes knew him and they liked him. And they called him a soft touch because he always paid very generously. So they knew that he was wealthy and that he lived in a nice house. On the afternoon before Halloween, Navarro received an unexpected phone call. It was Paul Ferguson, a 23-year-old male prostitute. Paul asked if he and his 17-year-old brother Tom could come over. Navarro agreed, but these two young hustlers had something more diabolical in mind than just turning a quick trick. Retired LAPD detective Norm Allen. Mr. Navarro had mentioned that he, uh, quote, had $5,000 in this room, but what he meant was he had just had his living room all remodeled and spent $5,000 on remodeling. And these fellows figured that he was $5,000 in that room. Clearly, these two were not the brightest stars in the galaxy. But what do you expect from a couple of two-bit punks? They came in, he started serving drinks, and um, more drinks. Eventually, they had dinner. He, um, 
heated up a uh, chicken gizzard casserole that his secretary had made for him. During that time, Navarro talked about his career. Navarro was more attracted to the older one, and he started giving him compliments and telling him he could be another Burt Lancaster or Clint Eastwood. They continued to drink. Eventually, they got to the point where they were going to decide who was going to stay, which one of them was going to stay the night. Paul said, well, you know, we don't have a car. We live 30 miles from here. Is it OK if we just both stay here? And so Navarro agreed. Paul and Navarro went, to, went into the bedroom and got drunk, falling down, pitiful drunk. Paul and Ramon Navarro drained two bottles of vodka almost drink for drink. Nobody will ever know when the drinking stopped and the beating began, but we do know that Navarro put up a valiant fight. This beating went on for a number of hours, and these fellows figured that he was $5,000 in that room, and that was for the cause of the torture. When he couldn't tell him where it was, he kept torturing him. During this time, Navarro was sitting on the edge of the bed saying the Hail Marys. At some point, Tom, the younger brother, made a phone call to his girlfriend, Brenda Metcalf, who lived in Chicago. Tom told her that they were in the, in the house of a big movie star. He told Brenda that they were there to force Navarro to tell them where he had hid $5,000. She heard screams in the background on occasion, and on another occasion, uh, someone picked up the phone extension, it said something, and then dropped it. But Navarro's screams for help went unanswered. Up next, the aftermath of the savage torture of a once proud movie hero. Two psychopaths were on the loose, and members of the Hollywood community were double locking their doors. On Halloween morning, 1968, the horribly beaten body of 69-year-old silver screen star Ramon Navarro was discovered by his secretary in his Hollywood Hills estate. Navarro was found tied up with electrical cord and left naked on his blood-soaked bed. LAPD detective Norm Allen was assigned the Navarro case. He recalls the murder scene. The uh, living room was kind of disheveled. The furniture had been turned over into pictures on them. The walls had been askew and, and uh, we went into the bedroom and the bed was right there and uh, we uh, saw this uh, uh, Mr. Navarro, an elderly gentleman, and he was uh, pretty well battered and beat up. He, uh, he had blood, he had his, uh, turned out his nose was broken, he had blood, he, blood all over his face and he had cuts and bruises and uh, he was nude, so this is how we first discovered him. Former chief medical examiner for the county of Los Angeles, Dr. Thomas Noguchi, performed the autopsy on Navarro. Ramon Navarro died of uh, asphyxiation of the, uh, due to uh, aspiration of uh, blood as a result of uh, uh, injuries to the nose and the face and the neck uh, area. In the late term, it means that Ramon Navarro it, uh, was drowned with their own blood. The question for police was who tortured and beat a defenseless elderly man beyond recognition? Well, it took only two days to track down the killers, Paul and Tom Ferguson. One of the keys was that telephone call that the young brother had called his uh, girlfriend. We checked the telephone records. Which led right to Tom Ferguson's girlfriend in Chicago, Brenda Metcalf, who provided police with enough information to arrest the two. The Ferguson brothers went on trial for the murder of Ramon Navarro in July of 1969. Mark Brandler was the presiding judge. Apparently, he was subjected to the battery and beating for some three hours. I was most impressed with the brutality and of the homicide, and also that, uh, that the two boys were, for hours, they tortured this man. The trial lasted six and a half weeks, and uh, the jury found each of the defendants guilty of uh, the first-degree murder. I agreed with the verdict of the jury that the verdict was the proper one. In 1969, the Ferguson brothers were both sentenced to life in prison. Eight years later, 25-year-old Tom Ferguson was granted an early parole. He has since returned to prison for the rape of a 54-year-old woman and a sex crime involving a child. Tom Ferguson is scheduled for release in the year 2001. Big brother Paul served nine years of his life sentence for killing Navarro, and guess what, folks? He's out there somewhere right now. To add insult to injury, the memory of a Hollywood legend, someone who brought pleasure to millions of moviegoers, is left forever scarred. Yes, he had problems. Yes, he drank too much, whatever. But he still did not deserve the fate or the death 
that was given to him. Jim Bacon remembers his last lunch with Navarro just two weeks before the murder. During my luncheon with Ramon, uh, he said something that reminded me very much of Gloria Swanson and Sunset Boulevard. He said that back in my day, and that's the way he phrased it, back in my day, we had faces. And he says, people loved us for our faces because they knew who we were. Or at least they thought they did. So maybe Ramon wasn't perfect, but hey, this is Hollywood. Everybody's got their secrets. It's just a shame that Navarro's secrets led to such an unspeakable death and a legacy forever fouled by violence and perversion. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time we take a stroll along the dark side of the Walk of Fame. Because I feel that if God gives you a certain amount of money, you should learn how to handle it. And don't ever trust anybody. <laughs> I'm very happy the way I am now. I don't care what I look like as long as I'm healthy and clean. <laughs>